Hi, I'm Daryl Urbanski, and welcome to the Best Business Podcast. My mission is to help create 200 new multi-millionaire business owners. How? You'll do better when you know better. In my interviews, you'll hear from self-made millionaires, seven-figure business owners, authors, and world-class experts sharing how they did it so you can too without experiencing the same obstacles they did. When your life and your business grow as a result of what you're about to discover, please call me and tell me about it. The number to leave a voicemail is one 888 844-GROW. That's 1-888-844-4769. Long distance charges may apply. Dial now to call me, connect, share your personal story of how my interviews have helped, or share your current challenges and frustrations so I can connect you with an appropriate course, coach, or help you if you connect. Now, if you like this interview, please share it with a friend you think will benefit. They'll appreciate it, and I will as well. You can also connect with me on social media. Look for Daryl Urbanski, D-A-R-Y-L, Urban Ski, U-R-B-A-N-S-K-I, and add me so we can be friends. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy what I've prepared for you right here, right now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always, and today we are joined by our three-time returning guest, Ryan Levesque. And Ryan is well known for creating online lead and sale flow models, most notably his survey funnel formula from his number one best-selling book, Ask, which has helped thousands, possibly tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of business owners launch successfully. Highly recommend you check it out. But today we're here to talk about his new book, Choose, which is about choosing which market to enter into. Now, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us today. It is always an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. But the first question I have for you, which is the question everyone asked me when I talked about this, is what's the difference? What, how is Choose going to be different from Ask? Aren't they kind of talking about the same thing? Can you dive into just a bit of the nuances between the two books? Absolutely. You know, Daryl, thanks, man. It's great to be back. And I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to share with, with you and your audience. So Ask. Ask is a book that is all about how to figure out what people want to buy in any market. And it's the methodology that my team and I have used to go into 23 different niche markets, ranging from things like orchid care to memory improvement to jewelry to water filtration system, satellite TV, business funding, golf, tennis, all these different markets. And when I wrote that book, it revealed the methodology that anybody can use to successfully enter any new market to understand what it is that that market wants to buy. But what I didn't teach in that book was how and why we chose those 23 markets in the first place. And one of the things that I found, Daryl, with uh, Ask is uh, when you write a book like Ask that sold hundreds of thousands of copies, it's published in all these different languages, you know, Inc. Mark, Inc. Uh, Magazine rated it the number one marketing book of the year and Entrepreneur rated it their number two book of the year when it was released. You write a book like that, you get letters from people who say the book changed their life, right. which is awesome. But you also get letters from people who say, Ryan, I read your book. I followed exactly what you teach and it didn't work for me. Mm. Now, when you get letters like that, it's like a sucker punch in the gut, right? Because right. you're thinking, well, what did I do wrong? Like, what did I miss? And you you start questioning yourself. And so it kind of led me down this rabbit hole that became a three-year research project to understand why were people who were using the ask method, in some cases, still failing. Mm-hmm. And all roads kept coming back to one thing. Mm. They were choosing bad markets. markets. So, and so it kind of led the quest to create, to answer the question, what does it mean to be in a good market versus a bad market? And that's what this book is all about. Now, for people that are listening, joining in, if they haven't listened to the first two interviews, highly recommend you go check them out. They're value-packed, phenomenal. I've gotten tons of letters, from, emails from people saying that they transcribed it because it was so valuable. But can we do a high-level overview of Ask here? And, and maybe I'll start because I know you've probably talked about it so much. But the Ask, and not to oversimplify it at all, it's definitely worth reading the book. It is the concept of Ask is to have a, like a deep dive survey, you call, which is really kind of asking all the important questions to figure out the edge of kind of the landscape, so to speak, of people's uh, interest in a particular topic. So you have this deep dive survey, you get a hundred to a few thousand responses, and then you have a system for organizing the responses where you can kind of identify where people seem to have the most pain, the most emotion, and that's where people would just dive in. Is, is that accurate? 
Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a key part of it, right? So uh, the deep dive survey is a key component of the ask method. And it's really the first big domino that helps you understand your market at a deep emotional level. And then from there, that deep dive survey allows you to do a couple of things. Number one, it allows you to identify where is there unmet demand in your market. So where are the opportunities to create a product, to build something, to build a business. That's the first thing. Second thing is it identifies what type of language to use in your marketing. So what sort of natural consumer language should you be echoing back in your emails, on your webinars, in your social posts, in your videos? Basically everything you do should be reflection of what it is your market is telling you. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is to identify what we describe as the buckets in your market. So when you try to be all things to all people, no matter what market you're in, you end up being nothing to nobody, right? That's as the saying goes. And so the, the reality is you wanna identify what are the most hyper-responsive buckets of people, what I call profit pools, the segments of every market that you want to speak to in a very specific way, differently from the rest which allows you to, on your website, diagnose and prescribe. Just like you and I would be doing if we're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you know, if, if, you, if I said, you know, Daryl, how can you help me? You're not gonna dive into your spiel around how you can help me. You're gonna begin by asking me a few questions. Right. Well, that's where the ask method really shines, where when someone lands on your website, you can begin by saying, hi, my name is Daryl. I've been working with people for the last 20 years. And before I can tell you what the right next step is for you, if you take a moment, to answer a few simple questions, click the button below, I'll be able to guide you to the best resource for you. Mm. And so that's the ask method in a nutshell. It's a process for doing all this that makes it not overwhelming, that makes it step by step, and allows you to really achieve some pretty remarkable success um, by better selling and better serving your audience. Yeah, I remember that's like the, the real claim to fame was that this works very effectively on cold audiences, cold traffic. It's kind of the holy grail in a lot of senses. And it makes sense because prescription without diagnosis is malpractice in medicine. So you've taken that kind of that consultative selling process and turned it into something that you can automate and leverage and scale online. So we do the deep dive survey, we get our answers, we identify them, then you would have us create a micro survey or a micro quiz then. So once you get your answers, you turn that into a quiz where now, like you said, when new people come, you they kind of self-select almost like in a choose your own adventure, multiple steps through a quiz, and they land on the page that's prescribed the solution for them. And it might be the same solution for everybody, but at least now you can speak to them in their language about their pain points. And of course, there's a lot of other details in that that they have to go get from the ask book itself but so where was the challenges what were the biggest challenges you had like you said picking the niche would was why you in, what inspired you to do choose but where were people tripping over themselves and ask like if I do the survey and I get a thousand responses and I organize them into buckets is it not self-evident which one to go in like what were some of the you know what I mean what were some of the hidden dangers I guess that people didn't yeah you know so yeah, so it's a couple pitfalls. So one example is people would follow this process and they couldn't get anybody to fill out their survey. Mm. And they're saying, wait, I'm asking and nobody's answering. This process doesn't work. Well, if you ask people a question that they have absolutely no interest in, if there's no demonstrated demand for the thing that you're asking around, well, it's natural. Like if I said, hey, you know, Daryl, uh, what's your biggest challenge when it comes to menopause? <laughs> raw market right right you're gonna be like dude why are you asking me that that's like weird it has yeah. nothing to it's just an irrelevant weird. question to the market <laughs> and so people were running into situations like that that's an extreme example but they were asking questions not getting responses and it's because they weren't um, choosing markets that were going to set them up for success and the metaphor that i use in choose it's like this it's like when you start a business it's kind of like tossing your raft in a river right you toss your raft in a river and you expect that that river is gonna get you to your destination, where you wanna go. Just like when you start your business, you expect that that business is gonna take you to your desired outcome. You can have the best raft that money can buy. You can hire a crew to be in that raft with you. You can get the best equipment that money can buy. You can row 18 hours a day, but if you put your raft in the river in the wrong direction, or you put your raft in a river that doesn't have any water in it, it does not matter mm. how good that raft is and how hard you row, you're never gonna get to where you wanna go. And that's what was happening. I'd given people the best possible raft that I knew about, but I wasn't teaching them how to find 
good rivers. rivers. And that's what this book is all about, what Choose is all about. It's all about how to find that hidden river that's perfect, not too big, not too small, the river that's going to take you to exactly where you want to go. Got it. So this is about the pre-survey kind of research. Is that accurate at all? It's the step before. So even though it's published after Ask, Choose is a prequel. It. It's before you ask, you first need to choose. You first need to begin by choosing the right market. And once mm. you've chosen the right market, and only after you've gone through this process are you ready to ask. And mm. so even though it's published after ask, it's really the book that you should read first. Yeah, I think that's fantastic because you know, the difference between salad and garbage is timing. And that's I've, I remember <laughs> seeing some results of a couple of VC companies or some TED Talk or something. It was like over 200 companies they invested in, they tried to identify what was the number one thing that helped them be successful. And a lot of times it was the timing. It was the timing of what the market needed, wanted, and what the product service the company was offering. And it matched up and aligned with it perfectly, which is why Ask is so powerful. And I guess Choose kind of makes it even like as an exponential multiplier of that. Because if you're starting with a really good river, right, when the t a good body of water, when the tide rises, all the boats rise. So if you choose an empty pool versus a full pool, and then you do the apply the ask theory, then I guess you're going to have exponential results. So how, again, I guess, so can you kind of walk me through the process a little bit? So, like, I'm familiar with the ask methodology. You know, I've, I got the surveys down. I'm ready to survey my audience and kind of build this. But what do I need to do beforehand then? Where, like, yeah. Yeah, before we do it, so the big mistake that I saw people make at uh, over and over again all comes down to one thing. People tend to ask the wrong type of question when they're first starting out. Most of the conventional wisdom out there would lead you to believe that the thing you should be focusing on when you're starting a business is answering the question of what. What should I create? What should I build? What should I sell? But the reality is the question you want to first focus on answering is who. Who are you going to serve? Who is your market? And who is your ideal customer? And there's a process to this. And it's something that when I saw people failing over and over again, choosing bad markets, it led me down this three-year research project to really identify, well, what does that mean? Like, it's easy for you and me to have a conversation and say, you know, choose a good market. But like, what does that mean exactly? Like, how do you dimensionalize that? And so what I looked at, Daryl, were I looked at the 23 niche markets that we've gone into over the last 10 years. And truthfully, some of them have been more successful than others, right? So I wanted to know why, were there any factors that were common among the ones that were more successful than the rest? And then we did the same thing with our students and with, with our clients. And what we found is that there are seven factors, seven factors that are uh, requirements that we found for something to be what we called a green light market, a market that we will pursue. And the book, the way it's structured, is a three-part framework where you brainstorm, test, choose. So brainstorm possible markets that you're thinking about pursuing, take that short list of ideas, run them through these tests, determine if your market is a green light, a yellow light, or a red light. And if it's a red light, go to the next one on the list. If it's a yellow light, proceed with caution. And if it's a green light, proceed confidently to begin by asking. So once you choose, your next step is to ask. And so it leads seamlessly into the ask method process that you are super familiar with and that you know. And it's the step that you wanna do beforehand. And I'm happy to talk about kind of some of the key uh, pieces along the way that you wanna focus on when you're deciding who is your who? What market are you gonna focus on? Mm. Yeah, because I think that's incredibly powerful. It's there are riches and niches, bitches. And uh, I think choosing a proper and appropriate niche is a huge advantage. So, yeah, let's talk. So brainstorm markets, that's what you – I want to help. Do you recommend people focus on – I mean, obviously, they focus on the who first. So what are the typical mistakes? They're like, I love baking pie, so I want to open up a bakery. And then they just think that, oh, well, opening up a bakery downtown is probably a good idea because downtown is busy. Is that the typical <laughs> kind of process people go through? And how would you recommend they approach it differently? Yeah, you know, what's interesting is that in our research, I found that there are really four types of entrepreneurs, like four types of people who want to be their own boss, start their own business. And, and as I talk through these, anyone listening to this, I encourage you to reflect on which of these best describes you. If you had to choose one, if one of these was your dominant type, which one best describes you? And even Daryl, for you, man, I'd encourage you to do the same thing. We'll play a little game 
as I go through each of these four, let's talk about which one you think you most identify with. So four types of entrepreneurs. The first type of entrepreneur is uh, what we call a, a mission-based entrepreneur. Now, mission-based entrepreneurs are the type of people who want to fix some wrong in the world. They want to right some wrong in the world. They've got some cause that they would die on a hill for. And so one of the examples I share in the book is Christy Kennedy. Uh, Christy Kennedy ha has a son who uh, is autistic and he was bullied in school. So he's bullied in elementary school. And so as a mom, she had to get involved with the school and, and basically stop it from happening. Um, and it kind of led her down this path where she said, you know, I want to eliminate bullying from the entire school, not just with my son, which led her to do the same thing across her entire school district and then her entire state. And now she's developed a program that's in over a thousand schools around the country, all designed to eliminate bullying in elementary school. That's an example of a mission. That's an example of a mission-based entrepreneur. Now it's in contrast with the second type of entrepreneur, which is more of a passion-based entrepreneur. So passion-based entrepreneurs have some sort of thing that they're really passionate about and they love. And they want to transform that thing into their vocation. So I tell Charlie's story in uh, in the book Choose. Charlie's a traveling musician, loves playing the guitar, wanted to find a way to make uh, playing the guitar a business. And so he built a business teaching people how to play the guitar online through a series of online guitar uh, programs. And uh, Charlie is an example of a passion-based entrepreneur. Now, the difference between these two our mission-based entrepreneurs typically want to move the world away from something negative, whereas passion-based entrepreneurs want to move the world toward something they love. So very different in that regard. But not all entrepreneurs, not all people are drawn to a social cause or a mission or have a passion. You also have um, what, uh, what I describe in the book as opportunity-based entrepreneurs. Now, opportunity-based entrepreneurs are kind of like entrepreneurs in the most classic sense of the word. Uh, opportunity-based people are the type of people who look around and they say to themselves, they see something, they say, how is it that nobody solved this problem? How, would he, how is it that nobody's created a solution to this thing? And you know, example I share in the book is uh, Dana Olbermann and her husband, Mike. Uh, they built a little company called Sleep Sense where they had uh, a newborn baby who was not sleeping through the night. And she went online, this is years ago, doing a ton of research and couldn't find any good information on how to get her infant to sleep through the night. So she started consulting with doctors, diving into the medical research, the scientific research. She started trying different things and one thing led to another and she was finally able to get her uh, newborn to sleep through the night. Well, they were having dinner one night with a couple down the street and told them that story and the couple said, we're having the same problem, can you help us out? And Dana helped out this couple, and then one thing led to another. They told somebody else, and before you know it, she built this business that served hundreds of thousands of couples around the uh, the world. She's been on uh, uh, Good Morning America. She's been on the Today Show, all designed to help parents with their newborn infants sleep through the night. Now, this was not something that she set out to do. It's not a passion. It wasn't a mission. It was an opportunity. It was just nobody else was doing this, and she just stepped into that. So that's the third type. And the fourth and final type is what we call an undecided entrepreneur. And that's who I was, like when I first started my business. Undecided entrepreneurs are the type of people who know they want to be their own boss. They know they want to do their own thing. They know they want to start some sort of business. They know that much. They just have no idea what that thing is. And for someone who's in that situation, if you're an undecided entrepreneur, I recommend doing what I advocate in the book, which is to start with a practice business. Just like when you learn how to drive a car, your first car probably wasn't like your dream car, but it was a vehicle through which you learned how to drive, right? You learned how to park, you learned how to turn, you learned how to you know, uh, shift gears if you learned on a stick. Like you learned all these things and then it's a skill that's now served you for the rest of your life. So start with the practice business. Uh, so we'll pause here and just Daryl, I'm curious. So of those four, mission-based, passion-based, opportunity-based, undecided, when you first went into business for yourself, is there one or more of those that really stands out to describe uh, best who uh, who you are and who you identify yeah, with? Yeah, when I first see, that's a different question. So I was thinking this, and I can think of times in my life where I've been almost every one of these in a different business or project. But mm -hmm. when I first got started, it was a passion based. I wanted to I wanted to build a hostel on the border between Canada and the U.S. and a Soyuz. 
and it was going to be a youth hostel that was going to use renewable energy, solar panels, wind energy, all oh, that wow. sort of stuff. I was really into earth ships. Michael Reynolds has been building these sustainable houses for now, probably 35, 40 years. Mm. And that was what I wanted to do. And I got a grant. I got all this money. I was, I think I was 18 years old and I got, I got an investor to give me something like 50, 60 grand for the down payment on the property and a bank approved a loan for $350,000. And I just backed away because I was like, I haven't even had a girlfriend for a year at this time. I had a car <laughs> and I'm about to marry like three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars in this project. And even if it fails, I'm going to spend the next like if it's successful, I'm going to spend 10 years working this thing. And if it fails, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to pay this money. That's what I thought. Right. I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to pay right. this back. So I, did, I didn't right. do it. But that was the original one. And I put a ton of work and somebody actually went and did it. There's actually a hostel in a Soyuz now that's doing that. Because I worked with the economic development officer and the chamber of commerce. Anyway, I got really involved. But it was the first one because that's what you asked. It was passion-based. It was definitely passion-based. Very interesting. And you even alluded to it that over time, you've probably evolved as a person, of course. Mm -hmm. And in this framework, probably uh, changed, which is very common. It's not uncommon for people to move from one uh, type to another as they mature, evolve, have more life experience, and um, and move on. So it's what the reason why I bring this up is you asked me a question, which is what are the pitfalls to avoid? Mm -hmm. And the the interesting answer is that there's a shadow side to each of these types, mm. and it's a pitfall that you need to watch out for if you fall into one of these four types. So for example, the mission based entrepreneur, the most common pitfall, the shadow side to watch out for, mission based entrepreneurs tend to be so drawn to their mission that they sometimes struggle to actually make money. So in other words, they build a business that fuels their soul, but it's not filling their bank account. Mm -hmm. And so you need to watch out. Now, passion-based business uh, owners run the risk of taking something that they were once passionate about and it becomes a job. job. Yeah. <laughs> and they lose all that passion for that thing. So you gotta watch out for that. Now, opportunity-based entrepreneurs have the opposite a challenge where they create a business that is uh, something that is very lucrative that makes money, but they wake up one day, 10 years later and say, what was the point? Mm. Right? What's the connection to this? And undecided entrepreneurs uh, run the risk of uh, swimming in analysis paralysis forever. What type of business should I start? I don't know. And never actually taking the leap. So once you recognize which of these four types is at least at this point in your life, the most dominant one, you can be self-aware enough about the shadow side associated with it and avoid making those pitfalls. So uh, there is no one size fits all answer when it comes to what your single biggest pitfall is, but knowing your type can help uh, lead you in the right direction. Hmm. And that's very, very useful because then you know, because like going back to, I guess, using me as a case study, I knew then that I was very passionate about the idea but I didn't have a mentor. I was going into the business on my own. I never started a business before. And so I, you know, I, I guess I'm giving myself credit here. I, I noticed that I was driving headfirst into a passion based business. I mean, you said that the shadow is killing their passion. I also think the other part could be being blind and not thinking things through. And so, um, luckily enough, I did think it through and didn't do that. Although who knows, it maybe would have been changed my life, put on a totally different path. So once you figure out yourself and what to be aware of, what's the next step? Yeah, so once you know what your type is, then it's about brainstorming the different possibilities and running those possibilities through a series of tests. The first test, I'll talk about a few of them. The first test that's really important is looking at what's called the five market must-haves. So um, if you're familiar with the work of Jim Collins, good to great, great by choice, built to last, uh, Jim Collins' work is uh, really centers around studying publicly traded companies and looking at how companies that have been successful for decades are different from those that are successful for a season and then kind of fall off or you know end up going bankrupt. And he looks at the factors that separate um, you know the uber successful long term uh, companies versus the rest. And similarly, uh, I wanted to look at the and identify the factors that separated you know uh, businesses and niches that have been uh, successful for decades. Uh, 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 for us, for our clients, for our students, versus the ones that um, you know were successful for a season and just didn't kind of uh, ever take off. And we found that there are these five factors, five market must-haves. And um, I'll talk briefly about each of these. And it's helpful if you're listening to this right now and maybe either you have a business idea or you have a business to just uh, 
think about, does your market check off these five boxes? And if it does, awesome, great. You can move on to the next step in the process. And if it doesn't, if you're missing one or more, then it might mean that you want to consider possibly pivoting, maybe, a slight, maybe making a slight tweak, or even moving in a different direction altogether. So first market must have is what we call being in an evergreen market. Now, an evergreen market is a market that uh, was relevant 10 years ago. It's going to be relevant 10 years from now and probably 100 years from now. Now, I learned this lesson the hard way. I talk about this market in Ask. I certainly talk about this market in Choose. My first business that we ever went into was a, a random obscure market of Scrabble tile jewelry. Right. Now, the, the way we got into this market is a weird and funny story. I'm an unde- Remember, I'm, I'm an undecided entrepreneur. So when I quit my job in 2008 and uh, I was you know, having many, many, many dinners with my wife saying, well, what about this business or what about doing this? At some point, one of these dinners, my wife says, all right, enough is enough. How about this? And she came up with her idea. And she said, take a look at this website. It's like eBay for handmade products. It was a new website at the time. It's big today. It's called Etsy.com. At the time, it was like a little startup. And everyone's heard of it now. Um, She said, look at the site, Etsy.com. She said, look at this jewelry that's selling. It uses its combined Scrabble tiles with origami paper. And her logic, which was good logic, was the fact that at the time, we were living in Asia. We're living in Hong Kong. And she said, look, we're in Asia. We have access to all this origami paper. We have access to inexpensive labor. We can manufacture this jewelry and import it into the United States. What do you think? And I said, that's a terrible idea. Like, I don't want to build that kind of business. Like, I don't want to be tied to a factory in China. Like, there's so many things I didn't, that just didn't resonate with me. So we closed the book on the idea. And then a few weeks later, I'm having, again, one of these conversations, you know, should we open a restaurant? Should we open up an import-export company? Should we, you know, create a Chinese learning company? Like, all these crazy ideas that I was, you know, (laughs) thinking about. And she said, hey, I want to show you the Scrabble tile thing. I was like, honey, I thought we closed the book on that. Like, why are you bringing that up again? And she said, no, 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 no. Check out this woman's shop. She's not selling the jewelry. She's teaching people how to make the jewelry. Mm. And check out, check out her sales. See, the cool thing about Etsy is that you can look at a person's sales history. So you can look at how many sales they made today, yesterday, the day before that, last week. You can see every single day what their sales history is. And we went back about a month, two months, and we found that she was on average selling 30 copies a day of this digital tutorial for about 30, 35 bucks. We did the math. We said, holy smokes, she's making like $10,000 a month selling this one product. Yeah. So my wife bought the products. It was, she said it wasn't very good. She says, I think I can learn how to make this jewelry. So my wife learned how to make the jewelry. We created a better product. We started selling it on Etsy. We made $100 in our first month, $200 in the next month, $500, $1,000, $3,000, $4,000, $5,000, $8,000. And I remember turning to my wife one day. I said, honey, we're going to get rich. Like, this is crazy. This <laughs> we, is exploding. Our first it, honey, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get rich. And dude, literally the next month, our sales went down to almost zero. And at this point, I'd quit my job. My wife was in grad school, so she wasn't making any income. We're living in Hong Kong, one of the most expensive cities in the world, as you know. Um, Our savings had dwindled down to almost nothing. We had this moment where we looked at each other and said, oh, crap, what do we do now? And what I learned the hard way is that the Scrabble tile jewelry market was just a fad. It was a fad. It was like Beanie Babies or you know, Pogs or Pokemon Go or any of these things that's like hot for one minute and then just disappears off the face of the earth the next. Right. And so this moment, we had this kind of, you know, we looked at each other, said, oh, crap. Uh, My wife finished her her grad school. Uh, She said, I'll get a job. We moved back to the States. We moved to Texas. She gets a job. Her, Her academic background is in history. So she got a job as a museum curator making $36,000 a year. And I got to work to launch our second business. And this time I said, I'm not going to make this mistake again. And so I started doing research into, uh, I said, I don't want to pick something that's going to be a hobby that disappears in like six months. So I said, what are the hobbies that have been around forever? Like, what are the hobbies that have been consistently popular year after year, going back like 100 years? Mm -hmm. And the number one hobby in America over the last century plus has been the same thing. It's been gardening. Something like 200 million Americans consider gardening to be a hobby. And so I started doing research looking at different sub-niches and niches within the gardening market and eventually entered into the orchid care market. Mm. Now, the reason why orchid care even came into my awareness is because when we lived in China, 
we bought a bunch of orchids and uh, like two weeks later they all died. Right. And so I thought, well, if we had problems with our orchids, probably other people have problems, started doing research, you know, started asking, doing my surveys and everything like that, and found that there was demand. Well, compare orchids to Scrabble tiles. Uh, orchids, we took that business from nothing to about $25,000 a month in 18 months. At that point, my wife quit her job. We moved to Austin, Texas, took that business from $25,000 a month to about half a million dollars a year. And here we are now in this interview, uh, over a decade later, that business, number one, still exists today, and number two, still basically pays for all of our living expenses. Wow. So I share that example to show you how powerful it can be when you build a business in an evergreen market versus a fad market that's here today and gone tomorrow. So that's the first market must have, evergreen market. Love it, okay. Second market must have. I take a sip of water here. Second market must have. Now, <laughs> I thought at this point, I'm like, oh, it's great. You just pick an evergreen market. This is easy, right? Pick a market that's been around forever. Well, I had a couple misses after that. And it wasn't until um, I learned the difference between um, uh, when I learned the importance of market must have number two, which is uh, being in an enthusiast market. Now, an enthusiast market is in contrast to a problem solution market. Problem solution market is a market where you solve a problem and then people move on with their life. Classic examples are things like flood removal. Right. Like if you have a flooded basement in your house, you call up one of those companies, they clean it up, and then you never wanna deal with that for the rest of your life, mm -hmm. right? Uh, another example, wart removal. You get a wart on your finger, your foot, or wherever, you use, you know, you remove the wart, and you never wanna deal with it ever again. You're not signing up for any email newsletters around wart removal. Right. You're not joining any clubs, you're not joining any Facebook groups, you're not like attending any events. It's like not a thing, right? right. Um, so that's a problem solution market. Um, in contrast to that, you have an enthusiast market, which is a market where you can sell to the same person different products within the same market. Mm. So perfect example of that, Orchid Care is a great example, dog owners are a great example, right? Yep. Um, we got a dog last year. Uh, you bring a dog into your home, you're basically signing up for the next 10, 15, 20 years of your life to be a consumer in the dog market, yep. right? And you can think about all the things that dog owners buy from you know uh, doggy bowls to doggy food to doggy leashes, doggy collars, doggy Christmas ornaments, doggy yep. t-shirts, doggy everything, right? Yep. Um, so it's a great example of an enthusiast market, which is market must have number two. But it's not enough to be in an evergreen and enthusiast market. You also need number three, which is solving an urgent problem in the context of that evergreen enthusiast market. So for example, you go into the dog market, it's not enough to sell doggy mugs and doggy Christmas ornaments. You've got to find what's the urgent burning problem that people need solved immediately in this market. And I learned this firsthand when we brought a new puppy into our home last year, <laughs> the importance of potty training your puppy, right? right? If you bring a new puppy into your home and uh, the, the, the puppy is, you know, uh, yeah, peeing on the carpet, peeing on the sofa, peeing on the bed, peeing on the laundry, peeing on the floor, peeing everywhere, it's an urgent problem that you need to solve right away. It's a problem that at some point you say to your significant other, honey, we got to solve this thing tonight. Mm -hmm. And that's the type of problem that you're looking for. Uh, in the orchid market, the thing that triggers people to go online and actively solve a problem is when they wake up like we did and the once healthy orchid, the night before, you wake up the next morning and all the flowers have, have fallen off mm. and the leaves start to turn yellow. And you say to yourself, what did I do? Like, how did I kill this thing? Do I throw it away? Do I, can I solve it? Can I save it? What can I do? So that's market must have number three, an urgent problem in the context of an evergreen enthusiast so, market. Can I, can, can I define ahead. that? Is that like a trigger event? Is that what you're saying? You're trying to identify a specific trigger event that causes people to search to buy. Is that? Yeah. So what I, the way I describe it in the book, if we go one level deeper in terms of the nuance, is you're looking for what's called a $1,000 problem. So a $1,000 problem is a problem that people need solving now. And you're specifically looking for a problem that transforms from a $1,000 problem to a $10,000 problem under the right circumstances. I'll give you an example. <laughs> like traveling so doggy dog. peeing on, <laughs> yeah, doggy peeing on the rug, right? Dog pees on the rug at your house, it's fine. You can deal with it, you can clean it up. But imagine you have a puppy, Daryl, right? The dog's peeing on the rug and you are about to go on a trip next week. 
and you're going to take the dog with you. And you're thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, I'm going to be that guy at the airport. My dog's going to be peeing in the, on the floor at the airport. My dog's going to be in the airplane underneath my seat peeing. I can just imagine the pee dripping down the, air, the aisle of the airplane. I got to get this thing solved now. Like it cannot wait any longer. Mm. And when someone is in that situation, all price sensitivity goes away. That's right. You're not thinking to yourself, how do I save 10 bucks? How do I? No, you're like, I'll do whatever it takes. Example that I gave Dana Olbermann and her husband, Mike, they teach parents how to get their infant to fall asleep. That's a perfect example of a $10,000 problem. It happens a couple days, it's a $1,000 problem. But if you're not getting sleep, anyone listening to this who is a, pa- a new parent, if you're not getting sleep for more than a few days in a row, that is a miserable house to be in. <laughs> and when you have like an important business trip, an important meeting, an important job interview, that goes from $1,000 problem to $10,000 problem. Uh-huh. So you're looking for those specific circumstances that create a, that cause a problem that was once kind of bubbling and, and building in the background to now suddenly become the thing that people need to solve immediately, uh-huh. urgently. And so that's what you're looking for. Got it. So uh, that's number three. Now it's not enough though to be in an evergreen enthusiast market and solve an urgent problem. You also need to make sure you choose a market that has additional future problems as well. So dogs, dog market's another perfect example. So you help, imagine for a moment, you've got your puppy, you reach out to some website and you, you find a solution that helps you potty train your pet. Well, once you potty train your puppy, uh, then there's a whole host of additional problems that uh, one needs to solve, right? Mm-hmm. You might have a dog that barks. You might have a dog that bites. You you might have a dog that pulls on her leash when you're taking her for a walk. A dog that you need to teach tricks, you know, sit, stay, come on command. All these different things that can happen. And you want to make sure you're in a market where you have the opportunity to solve these future problems. Because here's the deal. If you can help someone solve that urgent problem, that $10,000 problem, you become their trusted advisor for life. You become their dog whisperer. You become their business whisperer. You become their guide, their mentor, their solution in that area of their life. And the only question that they have after you've helped them solve that problem is, hey, what about this thing over here? Can you help me with this as well? Mm. So Dana, perfect example. She helps uh, her parents uh, get their kiddo to sleep through the night. And they say, hi, I've got a, a kiddo now who's not eating who's not taking, who's not eating the right food. I have a kiddo now who's having trouble with this next milestone in their development. Who do you know? Can you help me with this as well? So it's important to be in a market that has those future problems. That's number four, but it's not enough to have an evergreen market, an enthusiast market, an urgent problem, and future problems. You also need number five, and that's this. You can't sell to broke people. It's a big mistake people make. Mm. You want to find a market filled with what we call PWMs, which stands for players with money. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean you need to sell to millionaires and billionaires. That's not the point. What you're looking for is a market where people are willing to spend, and you've seen this demonstrated, that they're willing to spend a disproportionate amount of their income in that area of their life. Again, you see this with dog owners, right? You see you know, what one might call crazy dog owners who will spend whatever it takes on their furry little friend, whether it's a doggy operation, doggy pet insurance, crazy pet spas and pet vacations and all these things where they might not be willing to spend that kind of money in other areas of their life. You see this with all sorts of hobbies, right? Um, Car enthusiasts that spend crazy amounts of money restoring their classic car. Golfers who are willing to spend whatever it takes to improve their golf game. These are the types of markets that you're looking for, markets filled with PWMs. Now, the good news is there are tests that you can perform to determine for each of these market must-haves, does your market check off the box? But in the meantime, so Daryl, just think about your business for a moment. Um, as you kind of hopefully have done, run your market through this uh, uh, these tests, this inventory. Um, how do you feel like your market stands up against the five market must-haves? Well, actually, I, I want to apply this to my girlfriend's business because she's the she's got the business that um, has had the best growth recently, and I think has the best opportunity for growth, just because. <laughs> 
She's been, she's created a writing agency over the last two and a half, three years. We've doubled it a few times and now she's really trying to, to scale. And now it's come down to literally choosing a new target market. She's built this business. She's got 18 writers. She's got like, she's almost been bored lately because she's got her, her, her operations buttoned up so nicely that she's really able to focus just on growth and, and driving it forward. And we've come up with a new offer recently. Um, I'm not going to, it's your interview, so I'm not going to talk about that so much, but just thinking about applying it to her business and which ones that it ticks off. I'm trying to think about how it applies. I mean, I guess I should mention the offer. So because she's got so many writers, because she's got such a phenomenal system for screening, hiring, training, and incentivizing them, anything that's written content is really fantastic for her as a product to produce. Mm. And she originally started doing SEO articles, got into doing emails and web copy for people, things like that. But still, she was hitting her head against this issue of, um, low ticket, like low, what am I trying to say? Low average order sizes. Um, and it's mm. kind of like why you're saying you want to deal with people with money because some of the people that she would come across were, were value shoppers, we'll say. So we're trying to figure out how do we target and grow her and double her business again and again. And now it's by changing the who, it's by changing the, the offer, changing the size of the deal, right? The, the doubling the deal size. So take and that's that. exactly what I'd be looking for. I'd be looking at in that market, I'd be looking for uh, how do we find evidence of what the PWMs are spending money on? And in the book, I share some keywords that you can look for. So for example, whatever it is that you help people with, look for words like retreat, look for words like VIP, look for words like experience, look for words like workshop, things like that that will give you clues around who else has already figured this out. Like that's the beauty, like mm. you don't have to be the first one to figure this out, somebody else has already figured this out. And the, just like in the Orchid, in the, um, in the Scrabble tile market, right? Someone else had figured out something that was working and we just identified the opportunities to improve upon that. It's one of the big mistakes I, I talk about in the book, which is this around competition, right? I always say, you know, when it comes to uh, competition, one of my mentors once taught me uh, this phrase that stuck with me forever, and it may be relevant for for you and your um, and your girlfriend's business, and that's pioneers get shot, but settlers get rich. Yeah, yeah. The pioneers and get really the, arrows, what that the means. settlers get the land. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just a, it's another way to say that, right? So and so the premise there behind that is, you know, don't try to be the first in your market to figure something out. If you look at the most successful companies of our time, you look at Google and Facebook and Apple and companies like that. None of them were the first to market. Google was not the first search engine. Mm -hmm. Facebook was not the first social media platform. We had MySpace and Friendster well before we had Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, Apple was not the first to sell smartphones or MP3 players, but what they identified was a proven market where people were already making money and people were spending money and they either built a better mousetrap or they uh, incorporated better marketing or they used a combination. Mm -hmm. And that's a secret, right? The secret, it's one of the um, th tests I talk about in the book, is to identify what's called the competition sweet spot. You want to find a market where there is some competition, where somebody else has already pioneered the market, but not too much competition that you're putting yourself in a, a red sea where you're going to be eaten alive. It's about finding a sweet spot. It's about finding a market that has some competition, proven market, not too much, and being right in the middle. And that's what I would advise for, for you guys in this business, is to, to find a segment of the market that's filled with PWMs, where somebody else has already proven this market and you're just doing things slightly differently or maybe slightly better in one or two ways that allows you to be successful in that particular space. Mm, mm. You know, it's funny because this interview wasn't scheduled based on my calendar or my availability based on yours, but that sentence right there, it, yesterday we kind of came down to one or another. So we were trying to choose between two different groups and um, we we're already leaning one way, but I wasn't sure, but just what you said there, it proved it. One, of, of the two groups, one of them is definitely players with money, and two, I already know two other people that are being successful in that group. So based on what you said, we would discard the second one, even though perhaps they're easier to reach and easier to access. I know that a lot of them won't be players with money um, mm. for her for that new offer and the new business. So one was podcasters, the other one were CEOs. CEOs have a lot more disposable income. And I know another gentleman oh. that had pivoted to target CEOs as well. So anyway, it's just perfect, perfect timing for that. So, all right, so awesome. we go through these tests. We figured out the evergreen market must-haves. We figured out these tests. Now, how do you build the confidence to choose? Is there any, like, do you need to do all the tests, right, before you can choose? Or do you know, like, what, when are you, can you be fully confident in what you're about to do? 
Yeah. So one of the things that's um, really, I think, powerful about this process is everything is built around a green light, yellow light, red light framework. So as you go through these seven tests, and we covered one of them with the uh, five market must haves, as you go through each of these tests, um, you get a green light, yellow light, or red light. Now, what that means is if you have a green light, then you can proceed to the next test, right? You know, keep going and move to the next test. If you have a yellow light, it means proceed with caution. And if you have a red light, it means stop here and go back to your list of possible ideas and go back to the beginning or go back to the previous step. And so everything is very clear from that perspective. And once you've finished going through all the tests outlined in the book, you will arrive at either a green light, yellow light, or red light business. And the way we define that is by distilling everything down to what we call a bullseye keyword. One bullseye keyword that determines exactly what you're focusing on in your business. And I explain how to come up with that bullseye keyword in the book. Now, let's say, for example, you have a bullseye keyword that is a green light. So you pick something like orchid care as an example, and it turns into a green light after going through all the tests outlined in the book, tests around market competition by evaluating the paid advertising that's being spent in that space, tests around market size by looking at the amount of search a volume for that particular topic that happens on a monthly basis. Going through the market must-haves, going through all the other tests in the book. Let's say you've got a green light keyword. Where do you go from there? Well, that keyword turns into the X in your deep dive survey. When it comes to X, uh. what's your biggest challenge, struggle, or frustration? Well, once you choose, your next step is to ask. So if your bullseye keyword is orchid care, when it comes to caring for your orchid, What's your biggest challenge, frustration, or obstacle? Please be as detailed and specific as possible. If your bullseye keyword is improving memory, one of the markets that I talk about in the book, when it comes to improving your memory, what's your biggest challenge, frustration, or obstacle? So once you choose and you've arrived at a, a green light keyword, your next step is to use that keyword to ask that market what their biggest challenge or frustration is. And that takes you to the next step of the process, which is to yeah. ask. Yeah, so, so we see how it all fits together. Yeah, it's it's actually very um, exciting because I, I don't know if the listeners are here, but exactly what you say, you're, you're narrowing down not only like if you're trying to start a business and you're thinking of doing one of four different things or one of five, or if you're only thinking of doing one thing, it helps you validate before you even get started how deep, how wide, you know, how acidic the water you're going to be swimming in is, right? You don't want to jump into an acid pool and... And if you can prevent that in advance. So now we've identified of these, which are the best. And then, like you said, when you can apply your ass methodology, now you're going to take the segment. Like that's hyper niching. That's that's not only taking a look at which markets have the best potential for growth and then really taking an objective look. And then like I love this. I love this, Ryan. Your stuff is always fantastic because now not only will people have this green, the seven factor green light uh, confidence. I don't know if that's the right term, but the confidence to go into them with the seven green lights. Now, after that, when they apply the ask methodology, they'll know they'll be able to get the traffic. Because I think that's also like one of the things you said in the beginning, which is also one of the things that I've heard a lot, is people can't get the survey, enough survey answers. And that in itself is kind of a, a red light, right? Like if you can't get enough surveys, then you're probably not enough traffic. You need deal flow. You need a consistent, you need a constant flow of people. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have to test messages out, right? You're going to have to sacrifice eyeballs right like it's just gonna have it's just a part of doing business you have to make an offer to someone that they say no to or that it upsets them or whatever and to do that you have to have certain things in place so that way at least when you do that you know you're not gonna you're not in a finite market like there's only a hundred people so I got to get it right the first time I ask because I only got a hundred of them you know like now you like you said it's an evergreen market. So there's a constant flow of river of uh, constant river of potential new prospects they're enthusiasts not problem solution which means that if you figure out what to offer them them, there's a high percentage chance that you have multiple things you can offer to them later on or other people you can partner with to sell them things. The urgent problem, the bleeding neck, which means it's a definable moment. It's a definable reason why to do business with you. And it's a definable point in time to get in front of them when they need you. Help identify who needs you. Like if you're putting an ad and targeting people on Facebook, right? Like how to flag the people that are need you right now and, and kind of pull them out of that, that pond, that audience. And then again, you already had additional future problems that's kind of built in. And then the last one is the fact that do these people have money? When you have all that, now now you're really set up prime that now if you apply the ass principles, you can then take that group, really niche it down, and now you are like hyper relevant, 
and it, it's just a fantastic model. It's a fantastic model. You can still build bridges, right, to others. It's not so much because I know some people are afraid that, like, if I'm for somebody, I sorry, it's the opposite. But if you're for everybody, you're for nobody. And some people are worried about being too niche that they miss out on other people. You can build bridges to those after. You're just talking about in the beginning, getting started, get the best chance of success, pick the best market possible and then apply your ask principles to make sure that you have the best messaging and even the best product because when you go through that survey process you really find out what people want so you know that you can deliver or not. I think it's a fantastic model. Um, where should they go to get the book? Do you want them to go to your site? Do you want them to go to Amazon? Where are the, what's yeah. the best, yeah. Yeah, you know, you know, so um, of course, I mean, it, this is a, a book you can get it in bookstores anywhere. It, you know, it's at Barnes and Noble, it's at Amazon. I think the book it retails for twenty four ninety nine in the U.S. and thirty three ninety nine in Canada. But I wanted to do something special. You mentioned you, you know, you brought me on the show before Ask was a phenomenon. Before it sold hundreds of thousands of books around the world, and I wanted to do something super special for any one of your listeners, and that's this. I want to give people a free hardcover copy of the book. All I ask is that you pay a few dollars shipping and handling, and I'll ship it to you wherever you are in the world. And on top of that, I'll include $200 in bonuses, including the audiobook version of the books. I think a lot of your listeners mm. of your podcast are, if you're like me, like you're the type of person that likes to listen to stuff, whether it's in the car, while you're working out, like, you know, on the way to taking your kids to school, whatever it is. So that's the first thing. Second thing is people always ask me, like, what are examples of niches that pass all seven tests. Like what are examples of niches that check off all these boxes? So as a bonus, I'm gonna include 25 of the niche markets I would be going into this year if I had the time that check off all these boxes. So this is for my personal vault, my personal list. I'm gonna give you this list, uh, plus a whole bunch of other cool bonuses. But the catch is you have to get your copy of the book at a very special link that is choosethebook.com forward slash BBP, which stands for Best Business Podcast. You've got to go to that special link, claim your copy of the book there, free copy of the book. I'll ship it to you anywhere in the world. Um, this is for my personal supply of books uh, here, not for my publisher. So it is kind of first come, first serve as long as we, as long as supplies last. But if you go to choosethebook.com forward slash BBP, a uh, special thing just for listeners of this podcast. Perfect. So once again, that is www.choosethebook.com forward slash BBP for best business podcast. Go there, get your free copy, just pay for shipping, plus get uh, over $200 worth of bonuses. That I want to, I'm going to go get that. I want the, to list the 25 niches myself, just out of curiosity, you know. Ryan, I love your stuff. We have mutual friends, mutual mentors. In fact, one of them wants you to give him a call sometime soon. But I love the value that you bring and that the stuff is always battle-tested, time-tested and true by the time you get here. And it's just fantastic. Some, not a lot of the stuff, like you even said, like Apple, they didn't pick a new market, right? The pioneers get the arrows, the settlers get the land. This concept of asking and, in, and in doing the market research has been around forever, but you bring a fresh view to it and you really do help make things simple. So for my audience here, I highly recommend Ryan's stuff. You know, it's it just, it works. That's really it. It works. It, it might take a little bit of work to put together, but if it's just, it's, it's worthwhile due diligence when it's something that you're planning on feeding your family with paying for your retirement, paying for people's medical bills. And just, you know, if you could get more results from the same effort, why wouldn't you? And so I highly recommend you go check out his book, uh, Choose, as well as Ask. Definitely go check out Ryan's stuff. Um, yeah, it's just fantastic. So, Ryan, thank you so much for coming again to the show. Is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? I do want to be respectful for your time, but is there anything before we go that I didn't talk about or ask you about that we should have touched on? No, the one last thing that I'll say before we wrap is this a piece of advice that was given to me early in my career and it's had a huge impact on me and it's something I share with all of our students and it's this. Remember, in business, you don't have to get it perfect. You just have to get it going. But the best time to get it going is right here, right now, today. So go out there and change the world. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's always an honor and a pleasure. You've reached the end of our interview. Now first, let me thank you for listening. I appreciate and respect you more than you'll ever know. And now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, what three lessons did you just learn? What three aha moments just jumped out at you? Second, what can you implement for yourself and your business in the next 24 hours? Third, 
What can you give to someone else to help you with or give them to just do it for you? Whatever it is, remember taking action is the secret sauce to results. Now, if you think this interview would be helpful for a friend, please give them a link to it. It'll help them and it'll help me too. I'd also like to invite you to help me find out more about the challenges you're facing, your dreams, your goals, and how I can help you overcome what's holding you back. We both do better when we know better, and your success is my success. So please reach out and interact. You can visit our website, bestbusinesscoach.ca for Canada or California, where I'm from and where I'm living. You're welcome to also try out one of our paid programs. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media channel you can think of. You should also subscribe to the podcast. And if you're enjoying them, please leave us a nice review. It really helps. That's all for now. Once again, thank you. Take care of yourself. And remember, the world needs the best business you can build. And I believe in you.